Samsung just officially revealed its latest flagship smartphones, the Galaxy S21, S21 Plus, and S21 Ultra. And normally, I would set things up with a little meandering backstory about the year Samsung just had, but forget it, I know what you're here for. I got the chance to spend a little time with all of the new Galaxy models, so let's just dive into our first look. After I make one quick note, that is. We had very limited time with all three of these devices, and the models we had access to weren't completely final, so I will be saving more detailed impressions for our full reviews, which are coming soon. All right, now with that out of the way, let's start with the foundation for all of these new devices, the Galaxy S21. It's obviously the smallest of the three, but it's also the cheapest, and more importantly, it's a lot cheaper than before. If you remember, the Galaxy S20 sold for $1,000 at launch, but the S21 costs $800, and that's still a lot of money, but this still feels like a really important price correction when you consider people are still generally more conscious of their spending now than they used to be. Selling a high-end smartphone, especially one with the newest, best Snapdragon 888 chipset for less than $1,000, obviously means Samsung had to make some compromises here and there. For one, this flat 6.2-inch screen only runs at a maximum resolution of 2400 by 1080 which means it's quite a bit less pixel-dense than last year's model. To make up for it, though, the screen has an adaptive refresh rate that ranges from 120 hertz down to 48 hertz, so you never really get much more on-screen smoothness than what's actually appropriate for what you're doing. I know not everyone will agree with Samsung's choice, but personally, I think it was the right way to go. When I was holding the phone at what felt like a normal, usable distance from my face, I could not notice the dip in resolution. And if I'm honest, the general kind of butteriness that I saw when scrolling through web pages and cycling through apps, that more than made up for the change. Once you see a screen moving this fast, I firmly believe that you'll never really want to go back, though I should point out you can by changing some settings. There's another change we should talk about here, and that's the S21's design. I am a big fan of the new look Samsung went with this year. The camera, which kind of just like stuck out before, now melts into the metal frame around the phone, which makes the whole thing look and feel a little more cohesive than the S20. Instead of using glass for the back plate here like it did with the S21 Plus and the Ultra though, Samsung went with a sort of hazy plastic polycarbonate. And again, I know some people aren't fans of that. That is completely fair, but just let me tell you, after handling all three of these new models, I really do not think most people are going to notice. It's almost crazy how consistent the fit and finish is between all of these phones at their staggeringly different price points. The S21 also feels like an incredibly fast little machine with that Snapdragon 888 and 8 gigs of RAM, though I obviously couldn't download, install, and run benchmarks or anything, so I'll have to dig into more of that later. I should also point out this trio of rear cameras, which includes a 12 megapixel standard wide with an f1.8 aperture, a 12 megapixel ultra wide with a 120 degree field of view, and a 64 megapixel telephoto. They all seem to take great photos, but we'll have to take time to see how they stack up to the competition. Now going into this, I thought the step up, the S21 Plus would be the least interesting of the three because it is literally just a bigger S21. The only real difference apart from obvious changes like screen size and battery is that the Plus also has an ultra wideband radio so you can more easily locate things you've stuck one of Samsung's new smart thing tracker whatever guys to. That said, I wind up liking the S21 Plus a lot more than I thought I would. For one, I really appreciate having this perfectly flat cover over this 6.7 inch screen because I have come to loathe screens with curved edges. My hands just keep touching the edges and tapping things I don't want them to. And seriously, the S21 Plus is the first big phone I've used in a long time where I didn't have to worry about this. It is, in a way, strangely liberating for me. Size-wise, Samsung also kind of hit the sweet spot here, which makes sense because Samsung always really intended for this middle child model to be the most popular. The fact that it didn't happen with last year's S20 Plus actually caught the company off guard a little bit. I suspect things are going to be different this year, especially because Samsung's new pricing structure just makes more sense for a phone like this. Don't get me wrong, $1,000 for a smartphone is still a lot, again, but it's much better than the $1,200 the S20 Plus cost last year. 
And then there's the S20 Ultra, which as usual is the biggest and best and most bombastic of what Samsung has to offer. The broad strokes here are going to feel really familiar. It still has a huge curved display, a 5,000 milliamp hour battery, a huge array of cameras around back, but this new design Samsung cooked up really does kind of shine for bigger phones. The S21 Ultra is technically a little heavier than the S20 Ultra, but to me at least, it's actually a little easier to manage. It's just nicer and more polished. And the screen, I mean, look, there's a pretty good chance this will be the best looking display in your house. Samsung went with a 6.8 inch dynamic AMOLED 2X display running at 3200 by 1440. And look, it's, it's Samsung, screens are their thing and this thing looks fantastic. Even better, it shares the same adaptive refresh rate as the Note 20 Ultra, which means you get super smooth 120 hertz when things are in motion, but the screen dials things down as low as 10 hertz when you're just, I don't know, looking at photos. That said, there is at least one change here I am really not a fan of. The Galaxy S21 Ultra comes in two variants, one with 12 gigs of RAM and 128 gigs of storage, and another with 16 gigs of RAM and half a terabyte of storage. At minimum, you're paying $1,200 for an Ultra. And yes, that's less than before, and I'm totally down with that. But to see Samsung remove expandable storage from its best of the best, no holds barred phone, I simply cannot get behind that. As usual though, one of the Ultra's biggest selling points is its camera system. There is a 108 megapixel wide camera with an f1.8 aperture that uses pixel bidding to produce 12 megapixel stills, a 12 megapixel ultra wide, and two 10 megapixel telephoto cameras, one with a 3x optical zoom and another with a 10x optical zoom. I tried out all of these cameras indoors, which was obviously less than ideal, but for now at least I'm cautiously optimistic about what they're capable of. At the very least, the terrible focusing problems we saw early on with last year's S20 Ultra are gone thanks to the new laser autofocus. Now, if you want to, you can still push in for those 100x space zoom shots. And I gotta tell you, they still do not look that great, but they are at least easier to shoot this time. When you're framing up, you can actually tap the screen to lock focus, but for many reasons, I'm still not sold. And of course, there is the S Pen, which for the first time works on a non-Galaxy Note smartphone. Now, you can use existing S Pens with the S21 Ultra, but it can't do any of the cool gesture controls or camera remote stuff because those S Pens can't connect to the Ultra over Bluetooth. This is all passive. If for whatever reason you really want to write on the S21 Ultra, you should probably buy this case with the built-in S Pen and slot because the other benefit of having an S Pen that doesn't go inside the phone is that the S Pen can be a lot bigger, which this is. And I have to say, writing with this feels so much better than using the little stick that comes with a Galaxy Note. But this change does come at a cost because this case makes the S21 Ultra, a big phone, feel even more enormous. In the end, I gotta say it, I like what Samsung has done with the Galaxy S21 series, but with the possible exception of maybe the Ultra, there's not a whole lot here to make these devices feel like immediate must-have upgrades. To me, at least, the most interesting changes are what Samsung did with the price. I definitely wouldn't have bought an S20 or an S20 Plus for $1,000 or $1,200, but for $800 and $1,000, well, my interest is peaked, and I'm sure that'll be the case for a lot of people. Some people will also be pissed because if you, for example, just bought a Galaxy S20 FE for not much less than the Galaxy S21, well, that's a little problematic and I'm sorry. In any case, there is still much more to get into with these devices. Once we get our review units, we'll start working on the full reviews and get you the full story on all of Samsung's new flagship phones. In the meantime, thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe if that's the thing you feel like doing, and we'll see you again really soon.